many, many thanks to the Sept d'Or de Genève, a group of talented young musicians who played an overture of the Septet of Beethoven. It's a premiere for the Salon, Salle Ivan Pictet, and I hope um, you've enjoyed our acoustics. Thank you very much for being with us. So, ladies and gentlemen, we are here to celebrate this evening. We are here to celebrate the achievement of seven outstanding individuals. They each received their prize or their certificate in Stockholm last Friday in a wonderful ceremony, which you're more than welcome to see on the website of the Foundation. Congratulations to the Foundation for making this available to us. They, um, as in every year since 2015, they have agreed to travel from Stockholm to Geneva to meet the international community, but more importantly, to talk about their projects with us. So this year, we've decided to adopt a format a little bit more festive, hence the music, the flowers, and all the smiles in the, in the room. And we will have the chance to ask them a few questions as they present their project and their certificate. So I would like to kick off the evening by asking the executive director of the Right Livelihood Award Foundation, Ole Fanukskou, to say a few words with us, for us. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. Director General of the UN Office of Geneva, dear Madame Dreyfus, laureates of the Right Livelihood Award, excellencies, dear friends, welcome. The Right Livelihood Award is an award for courageous people and organizations who are providing visionary and exemplary solutions to urgent global challenges. And looking at the state of the world, today this work is needed more than ever. Our laureates are needed as role models for the practical solutions that we need to urgently address global crises. And they are needed in order to give hope and inspiration that is so badly needed at times of despair. And for us, the end of the year is always the best time when after a whole cycle from the beginning of the year when we receive the nominations from all around the world where everybody can send us proposals for the award our research in different countries and then the meeting of our international jury we finally get to meet the laureates of the year and as you mentioned we celebrated them in stockholm now on friday and since three years ago on the European trip that we do with our laureates following the award presentation, we've added Geneva as the first and most important stopover, where since three years ago, thanks to the generous support of the Swiss Development Corporation and the hosting at EHUID, which we're very proud of, we have an office in this building, which serves as we say the embassy of the Mobile Republic of Laureates around the world to the United Nations here in Geneva. And this office has very much become the base of our ongoing work with all of those who have received awards since 1980. One third of all the laureates who are still alive have visited our Geneva presence and been doing different programs together with us since we started the office here uh, just three years ago. And it is thus not a coincidence that we have five former laureates also from four continents in the audience tonight. Nimo Basse, Alan Ware, Ruth Manorama, Sima Sama, and Helen Mack. And I now have the great honor to ask you, Helen, to come up on stage, laureate from Guatemala from 1992 to talk about the impact that this award had on your work, and then to start the introduction of the distinguished 2018 laureates. Welcome, Helen. <clears throat> Good 
good evening to everybody. I am honored by the opportunity to share with you today what the Right Livelihood Award means for those of us who have received it. And welcome the 2018 laureates to the Right Livelihood Award community. The Right Livelihood Award was given to me by the Right Livelihood Award Foundation in 1992. When I heard the news, I didn't know what it meant. I was seeking justice for the extrajudicial execution of my sister, the anthropologist Myrna Mack, assassinated by a military commando. It was the first human rights case treated by the Guatemalan justice system amidst the internal conflict. In that search, I observed that justice and security officials were so afraid that they had that fear that works as an absolute and tacit pact of silence. Thus, I understood that the road I was walking was the forbidden road, the road yet to travel. Some close friends told me once that there could only be justice if justice was for everyone. It was thus this journey, which I began as a path of personal and family dignity, ended up leading my conscience to a vocation of service and dedication for justice, truth, and the memory of my country. I think we all have reflected at some point upon our work in a context where millions of human beings are submerged in marginal, impoverished, and miserable existence, suffering the material and psychosocial consequences of so much dehumanization. The path that many of us have traveled and will travel can be quite a lonely path, loaded with stigma and criminalization from groups of power, which from their networks and influence develop narratives that neglect our struggles. For those who have received the award, it has meant a commitment to our struggle, not only because the work we do is recognized, but also because for many of us who are in the front line, it means a framework to protect our lives and make visible the impact of our work. We are ordinary people who work out of convictions. Perhaps it never occurs to us that we would have a recognition of what is natural for us. However, for many it means a source of inspiration and motivation. The rest of the world, we ordinary people like us can do what we do. Ethical, honest, courageous, committed, and visionary work with a tireless struggle for a just, peaceful, and sustainable world for all must be permanent. You, 2018 Livelihood Award laureates, who are also embarking on the path, should know that from today, you have a new company, an award that commits us to the challenges awaiting us. Thank you. We are now going to see a video which uh, shows the work that um, two laureates, 2018, have done in Guatemala. So we are going to watch a, a video. La corrupción no debe ser la regla en un estado.
The fight for human rights is directly related to the fight against corruption. For this reason, Tel Maldana and Ivan Velasquez receive a well-deserved honorary award. Aldana at the head of the public ministry between 2014 and 2018. Velasquez leading the International Commission Against Impunity in Guatemala, an independent and precedent body established by agreement between the state of Guatemala and the United Nations. As it has been said in the video, both led efforts to fight corruption and impunity of illicit, uh, illicit political economic networks rooted in the very structures of the state. In 2015, following the unveiling of the great corruption of my country, the population took the streets. The square where we all came together was an intergenerational inter meeting point. We felt, fresh, we felt a fresh way of active and critical citizenship that came to the meeting. A new era of young people that has firmly assumed the search for justice, injecting vitality and energy to the conglomerate of actors that had been on the road for justice for decades. At last, until then, our generation that was trying to involve the youth explaining the social consequences of human rights violation going unpunished. In the cases presented by the Public Prosecutor Office, NTT, blatantly is illustrated how the perverse system of human rights violations is replicated. Only that now, those violations has a different motivation and objectives. These awards come to Guatemala again, but in a turning point. We are currently debating whether to continue with a system of impunity or whether to change the system so those who have not traditionally wielded the political and economic power have the opportunity to advance toward a new country where the law is the same for all. To both, Delma and Ivan, I thank you all on behalf of the Guatemalans, of the Guatemalan people for giving us back our hopes and encouragement for keep on fighting. Thank you. I now, I now call Ivan and Telma, please come to the stage. Invite you to come. Señoras y señores, Guatemala es un país integrado por 24 grupos lingüísticos y cuatro pueblos, maya, garífona, xinca y mestizo. Se ha caracterizado por una marcada exclusión histórica de los pueblos indígenas en general y de las mujeres en particular. El acceso a los servicios básicos y recursos financieros formales Los servicios de salud y educación aún son limitados. Las desigualdades territoriales, étnicas y de género interrelacionadas intensifican las limitaciones de las personas para lograr una participación plena y el desarrollo humano integral. El racismo y la exclusión han generado diversas formas de violencia y discriminación estructural, legal e institucional que se profundizan en el caso de las mujeres indígenas. La historia de Guatemala es un relato que se puede resumir hablando de un conflicto armado interno de más de 30 años ocurrido durante los años 1962 a 1996. Relato de violencia, condiciones de racismo, machismo y debilitamiento del tejido social. Ese conflicto armado interno, de acuerdo con la Comisión de Esclarecimiento Histórico, dejó un saldo de más de 200.000 personas fallecidas, 45.000 personas desaparecidas y más de un millón de desplazados internos y refugiados. Tuvo como elementos causales la injusticia estructural 
el cierre de los espacios políticos, el racismo, la profundización de la institucionalidad excluyente y antidemocrática, así como la implementación de la doctrina de seguridad nacional. El 29 de diciembre de 1996 se llevó a cabo la firma de los Acuerdos de Paz. Estos acuerdos introducen las bases necesarias para el desarrollo en paz y auguraban un futuro moderno para el país. Pero la falta de voluntad política ha impedido durante 20 años su cumplimiento e implementación. Producto de ese conflicto armado interno surgieron los cuerpos ilegales y aparatos clandestinos de seguridad incrustados en el Estado. Esa realidad y ante un sistema excluyente que limitaba las opciones de desarrollo, caracterizado por la impunidad y la corrupción, motivó al Gobierno de la República bajo la gestión de sociedad civil en el año 2006 a solicitar a Naciones Unidas apoyo para la creación de un mecanismo internacional que ayudara al país a la desarticulación de esos aparatos clandestinos y a luchar contra la impunidad. Surge así la Comisión Internacional contra la Impunidad en Guatemala. De la mano de CICIG, el Ministerio Público inició una lucha contra la corrupción y la impunidad sin precedentes en la historia del país y con efectos tan importantes. Descubrimos que aquellos aparatos clandestinos de seguridad y cuerpos ilegales de seguridad se convirtieron en redes político-económicas ilícitas incrustadas en el Estado. Hemos demostrado que las instituciones públicas pueden funcionar para todos los ciudadanos y no solo para los que cuentan con el favor y la protección de los políticos de turno o para quienes pertenezcan a grupos de poder. Guatemala se había organizado para enriquecer a los actores de poder y eso es lo que hemos empezado a derrotar. Hoy en el país se sabe que, sin importar de quién se trate, la justicia puede operar bajo un Estado de Derecho como factor clave para fortalecer la incipiente democracia. Nuestra meta ahora debe ser que esa eficiencia se convierta en la práctica normal de las instituciones guatemaltecas para cumplir con su compromiso con la población. Hemos demostrado también que guatemaltecos y guatemaltecas unidos podemos tener un país distinto. Sin embargo, también nos ha quedado claro que las prácticas del pasado de cooptación del Estado, polarización, campañas de desprestigio y hasta amenazas a la integridad física de quienes hemos trabajado en la lucha contra la corrupción y la impunidad son todavía muy fuertes y utilizan muchos recursos económicos y políticos. En este avance en Guatemala, debo reconocer el rol que la sociedad civil, fiscales y jueces y la comunidad internacional han tenido en el esfuerzo anticorrupción. Sociedad civil y comunidad internacional han sido dos acompañantes que no han dejado de caminar al lado de nuestra gente para buscar esa transformación que hemos iniciado. El mecanismo de la Comisión Internacional contra la Impunidad de Naciones Unidas ha demostrado ser exitoso apoyando a una institución como el Ministerio Público comprometida con los más básicos principios de justicia e integridad. Sin duda, bajo esa alianza, hemos logrado avances que evidencian la descomposición de los partidos políticos, de la administración pública y de las cúpulas de poder que se agrupaban para concentrar los recursos de un Estado que olvidaba fortalecer a las instituciones públicas y olvidaba a sus ciudadanos. En ese contexto, recibir el Premio Nobel Alternativo es un estímulo, no solo personal, es un aliciente para la población cansada de la desigualdad, de la pobreza, del hambre y de la falta de oportunidades. Lo recibo con humildad como una ciudadana guatemalteca que lo entrega en forma simbólica a ese pueblo que tanto ha sufrido. 
El reto al frente es muy grande, pero muchos guatemaltecos y guatemaltecas tenemos el compromiso claro y determinado de derrotar las viejas prácticas de corrupción y de impunidad y de hacer política para tornar la dramática historia de nuestro país en un relato de esperanza, de desarrollo y de paz social. Muchas gracias. Buenas tardes. Se nos ha concedido el Premio Nobel Alternativo porque, en palabras del jurado, hemos logrado exponer el abuso de poder y enjuiciar la corrupción en Guatemala, reconstruyendo así la confianza de las personas en las instituciones públicas. Otorgar un premio de derechos humanos por combatir la corrupción no es, desde luego, una confusión. Por el contrario, confirma que la lucha contra la corrupción es, tiene que ser, la lucha por la vida digna de todas las personas, pero especialmente de las mayorías excluidas, discriminadas, vilipendiadas, marginadas de los beneficios de la civilización que nos vanagloriamos de haber alcanzado. La corrupción es un delito contra la humanidad, contra la dignidad humana, que se ha podido desarrollar en Guatemala porque el Estado se convirtió en botín de los poderosos, de todas las especies, y perdió su norte, si alguna vez lo tuvo, de generador del bienestar colectivo. Millones de dólares producto de los sobornos que pagan empresarios nacionales y transnacionales se suman anualmente a los millones de dólares que son apropiados por funcionarios que aumentan desmesuradamente sus riquezas en un país en el que casi el 50% de los niños menores de 5 años, entre ellos 8 de cada 10 niños indígenas, padecen desnutrición crónica. 4.240 niñas en 2017 fueron madres entre los 10 y los 14 años. El 92% de los que cultivan la tierra para apenas subsistir ocupan el 21.9% de la superficie, mientras el 2% de los productores agrícolas de exportación tienen el 65.4% de la tierra, que por cierto es la más fértil. El 67% de la población general, 80% de la población indígena, vive en la pobreza, 34% en la pobreza extrema, para no hablar del acceso a los servicios de salud, del empleo, de la vivienda, de la educación, del analfabetismo y el semianalfabetismo. Luchar contra la corrupción no es solo búsqueda de vida digna en las condiciones materiales de existencia de la población, en la medida en que los poderosos ven limitados sus privilegios de impunidad y deben someterse al imperio de la ley, la lucha contra la corrupción es también la lucha por una justicia que alcance a todos los transgresores de la convivencia, cualquiera sea su condición económica, política o social. Pero para que esto sea posible... Es necesario un poder judicial fuerte e independiente, respetado por los demás poderes públicos. La justicia como uno de los pilares fundamentales de la democracia. Entonces, combatir la corrupción es también luchar por un Estado de derecho en el que, así como nadie está por encima de la ley, a nadie le pertenece particularmente el Estado, y todos los ciudadanos tienen la posibilidad real de participar en los asuntos públicos y ejercer la vigilancia y control de las autoridades que actúan en su representación. Ese fue el sendero que empezó a transitar Guatemala en el año 2015, cuando el pueblo comprobó que la corrupción se había apoderado de todas sus instituciones, 
que el Estado no le pertenecía y se volcó a las calles entusiasta y confiado en poder conquistar el futuro. Atrás quedaba un pasado de sumisión, de silencio y de miedo propiciado por eternas dictaduras militares y un prolongado conflicto armado interno que duró más de 36 años, dejando millares de desaparecidos y de víctimas inocentes, especialmente entre su población indígena, que padeció la política de tierra arrasada. Miles de niños, jóvenes, adultos y ancianos, mujeres y hombres, padres y abuelos, familias enteras, salieron felices y decididos, llenos de esperanza y de entusiasmo, a reclamar justicia, porque entendieron que la lucha contra la impunidad sí era posible, como posible era vivir en dignidad. Pero los poderosos, siempre astutos y siempre poderosos, supieron resistir. Y después de la sorpresa inicial de la primavera que los tomó desprevenidos, se reagruparon y pasaron a la ofensiva. No podían perder sus privilegios, no podían perder el monopolio de la impunidad que siempre han manejado, no podían perder el estado de ellos. Entonces financiaron agresivas campañas de desinformación, de desprestigio y de difamación. Se dijeron víctimas de la politización de la justicia, se quejaron de ser perseguidos políticos o de la amenaza del comunismo internacional que sobrevive en sus mentes calenturientas. Hicieron demostraciones de fuerza y desempolvaron los símbolos de la represión y parece que han recuperado el control. Para eso, además, hay dinero suficiente. Pero solo parece, porque Guatemala ya no es la misma. Conoció la luz de la verdad y sabe que esa verdad existe la tiene frente a sí y continuará su lucha por la dignidad humana. Recuperó el recuerdo de la justicia que tenía perdido en su mundo de sumisión, de impotencia y pesimismo al que quieren hacerla retornar. Señoras y señores, este premio que ahora nos conceden es sin duda un reconocimiento a la labor que han realizado nuestros compañeros del Ministerio Público y de la Comisión Internacional contra la Impunidad en Guatemala, a su compromiso y a su valentía. Pero especialmente es la felicitación que desde el mundo se le da a un pueblo que seguirá soñando hasta lograrlo con un futuro de paz, justicia y prosperidad para todos. Como dice el hermoso poema de Julia Esquivel, podrán cortar todas las flores, pero siempre volverá la primavera. Florecerás, Guatemala. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Your story is impressive, your engagement. Uh, we are all speechless. I uh, would like to offer one or two questions to, the, to, the pan to, the, to our laureates. If anybody would like to ask them one question or two. Yes, this gentleman. You say... Alex, sorry. Uno de los sobrevivientes 
de la civilización inca. Yo me identifico con mis hermanos de Guatemala, mayas, que han sufrido tanta represión y miseria. Yo les digo que la, el Estado neocolonial sigue vigente en América Latina, sea en Guatemala, en México, en Bolivia. Somos víctimas de las empresas multinacionales. Yo quisiera felicitarles de todo corazón y decirles que transmitan nuestros saludos al pueblo guatemalteco, particularmente a los mayas. Aquí, en representación de Tupac Amaro, he batallado 40 años en la Comisión de Derechos Humanos sin éxitos, sin éxitos. Muchos abrazos, muchas gracias. Thank you. Alex, I'm sorry I haven't presented you. If you could just summarize the point or the question for us. Yeah, he just uh, wanted to share that he identifies with um, the uh, population with the um, country of uh, Guatemala and that he um, says that it's a situation that um, other uh, countries also have in Latin America, um, that they're influenced by international um, companies and that they suffer from it. And he wants to express his gratitude for the work that they have done with the International Commission Against Impunity. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, one more question. Just one more question. Muchas gracias por el espacio. Soy guatemalteca y conocemos muy bien a nuestros hermanos que están aquí presentes y que van a recibir este, este premio. Me conmueven mucho sus palabras al, al licenciado Iván. Gracias por traer nuestras voces, gracias por traer nuestras palabras, nuestros sufrimientos, nuestras tristezas, nuestras lágrimas. Su intervención ha sido conmovedora para mí, porque es la realidad que hemos vivido y que estamos viviendo. Y eso no termina, como usted dijo, no vamos a bajar la guardia, no vamos a permitir que nos, que nos sigan pisoteando los empresarios, los gobiernos que han acaparado nuestras tierras. Somos pueblos indígenas, somos guardianes de nuestros, de nuestros pueblos y eso necesitamos que se respete. Muchas gracias, aquí estamos para acompañarlos, los queremos mucho de verdad. She said she's from Guatemala and she, want, she was very moved by the words that they were sharing, um, that they're giving a voice to the, um, to the tears they, they have, to all the suf suffering they went through. And um, she also shared that um, they, as a, as a people, as uh, indigenous people, they won't stop to um, go on the streets to f fight for um, for justice, and so she wanted to thank them a lot for their work they're doing. Well, we wish we could have more time to uh, share your stories with uh, with us, but I think we will um, have to finish the Q and A for this uh, particular part of our program. Thank you very much for being with us. Thank you for your outstanding accomplishment. And um, we will follow you in your next mission in life. Thank you. <clears throat> I would now like to call on stage Sonia Tantik who is a representative to the UN of the International Federation for Human Rights, who will introduce our next laureates.
Good evening, everyone. I'm extremely pleased to be here tonight with all of you to celebrate the 2018 laureates from Saudi Arabia, Abdul Al Hamid, Muhammad Al Qatani, and Walid Abu Al Khair, who are represented with us tonight by Yahya Siri, a Saudi human rights defender, and Muhammad Al Qatani's son, Omar Al Qatani. The three Saudi laureates received the 2018 Right Livelihood Award for their visionary and courageous efforts guided by universal human rights principles to reform the totalitarian political system in Saudi Arabia. Three laureates are currently detained. To begin, we shall start by watching a short video about the laureates' work. Saudi Arabia has never had a reputation for tolerance and respect for human rights, but many across the world only truly realized the extent to which the authorities were willing to go to suppress critical voices with the disappearance and killing of journalist Jamal Khashoggi. But this is only one of the many gross and systematic violations committed by the authorities. And in fact, the vast majority of victims do not enjoy that much visibility. Like the laureates, all those within the kingdom who challenge Saudi Arabia's human rights record or peacefully demand basic freedoms, face arbitrary detention, unfair trials, and lengthy prison sentences. Recent months have seen a significant increase in the crackdown against journalists, human rights defenders, and other dissenting voices. The authorities routinely use and abuse uh, the judicial and legal system to target defenders, including this year's laureates. What is Extremely concerning is the increasingly broad range of repressive tools being used, such as travel bans, but also targeting the activists' families, torture and detention, which is widespread in Saudi Arabia, and alarmingly, even the death penalty being sought um, against a woman human rights defender who attended peaceful protests. Uh, I'd like to flag here that women human rights defenders face double the repression because they also face specific discrimination and violence on gender grounds. Um, it's about time our leaders stopped siding with the repressive ruling family and in instead chose to support the courageous activists who are promoting democracy and equality in the country. Because change, if it is to me meaningful and lasting, must come from within at the local level. And it is in that respect that the laureates' work for developing local answers to reform the system is truly remarkable. They have each greatly contributed to a domestic grassroots approach to human rights, um, which demonstrates a Saudi solution to promoting and realizing universal human rights in the country. And all of us must use our privilege to amplify their voices and raise these issues at the highest levels. We owe it to the laureates and to civil society in Saudi Arabia. And allow me to conclude by commending the three laureates' strong, self-sacrificing, and sustained dedication to promote respect for human rights in Saudi Arabia as they represent a great source of hope and inspiration
to people in Saudi Arabia, in the wider Gulf region, and to us all here tonight. Um, and without further ado, please join me in welcoming to the stage Mohammed al Qatani's son, Omar al Qatani, as well as human rights activist Yahya Asiri. Hello, everyone. I hope you, uh, all of you are enjoying your evening. I want to start out with saying thank you for everybody for being here and supporting us. This prize is extremely, extremely important because it shows how my father's work and effort have not been forgotten. I can't understand why. I can't understand why he would be locked up for something he didn't do wrong. My father is a really smart guy who worked hard for our future and for everyone's future. He only did what was right and should not be in prison. Everybody has the right to say what they want. Everybody has, has the right to a freedom of speech. This freedom is extremely important for society because without it, we only follow one opinion and one perspective. The last time I saw my father was two years ago. I visited him in jail. The first time me, the first time my brother and I waited for a full day, and in the end, we left without seeing him. Because he did not want us to see him with handcuffs. But the next time we came, we finally got to see him without handcuffs. Hugging my father for the first time in four years was an incredible feeling. I felt joy and sadness all at the same time. But mostly I felt lucky, lucky to have such an incredible father and lucky to be able to see him again. We sat with him for about an hour. I felt, it, but it felt like 10 minutes. I never wanted it to end. He was smiling the whole time and listening carefully to all our stories. He advised us to, con to concentrate and do well at school. If you fail, I fail, he told me. That's why I'm trying my best in my college, to have a better future and to make my father proud. But my goals is not only to be successful, but to help others in need, just like what my father is doing. Before he was locked up, my father would let me skip school and told me to come with him to his trial. To be honest, I don't remember much about it. But the thing that I can't forget is how confident and positive he always was. He took the trial like it was nothing. I wanted to send a message. I wanted to send a message to my father. Dear father, I know that you can hear me now. Keep going and doing what keep going and doing what you think is right. No one should tell you what to do or what to say. You have the right to express your opinion and no one can take that right from you. And to my father, I want to say that you should always have your right and no one can take it away and you should have it till you pass away. And to everyone around the world who is hearing me now, I ask you to stand by my father to keep his story and his beliefs alive. If all of us come together, and listen to each other, we can create changes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you for uh, the Right Level Hood Award, and thank you for every single one here to support the human rights. 
On the 9th of March 2013, 63-year-old Abdullah Al-Hamid was sentenced to 11 years in prison by, uh, the, by the Specialized Criminal Court, which is the court uh, set up specifically to try terrorism act or terrorism cases. Yet Abdullah was on trial for being human rights defender, a crime that would not strike terror into anyone but those who want to rule without ever being held in account. But Abdullah is not just a human rights defender. He's an inspiration, and to me, he's an admirer and a friend. Throughout his long presidented and principal fight for, for justice, despite repression, threats, and harassment from the Saudi authority, his, inspi his inspiration to human rights defender in our country, but perhaps more importantly, his also ins inspiration to the many other Saudis who are eager for Saudi Arabia, whether their rights and dignity are respected. <clears throat> In 1992, Abdullah helped to found a human rights organization. Because of that, he was, a, he was fired from his job as a university professor and was sent to jail. He would later to imprison again and again for his activity and defending human rights. First in 1993, then in 1994, then 1995, and later in 2004, and 2006 and 2008. The year after his release in 2009, Abdullah Al-Hamid was the co-founder along with Muhammad Al-Qahtani and nine other activists for the Saudi Civil and Political Rights Association, known by acronym Hasim in Arabic and Akbra in English. Muhammad Al-Qahtani was also later tried before the Specialized Criminal Court. Among several other things, Muhammad was charged with presenting false information about Saudi Arabia to the United Nations human rights mechanism. Because the Saudi authorities want only one narrative to reach out to the world, and that narrative is their own. The authorities also accused Muhammad without any sense of irony of calling the Saudi Arabia a police of state. He was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Through their organization, the Saudi Civil and Political Rights Association, Muhammad Al-Qahtani and Abdullah Al-Hamid, emphasized the need both to address specific cases for human rights abuse and violations, and to tackle the institutional and structural problems that allow such violations to happen. They were, they, they were uh, always trying to educate uh, the general public, and they led by personal example. It's an example that I myself try to follow. When the authority put them on trial, Abdullah and Muhammad took care to make it clear to everyone that it was the authorities who should have uh, to answer for their crimes and abuses, not human rights defenders for drawing attention to these crimes. In this fight, Muhammad and Abdullah were not alone. Walid Abul Khair, another dear friend of mine, fearlessly fought alongside them. And in 2008, Walid organized a hunger strike in solidarity with jailed activists. The following year, he, found, <clears throat> he founded the organization called Monitor of Human Rights in Saudi Arabia. Walid soon became one of the Saudi, uh, Saudi Arabia's most vocal human rights activists, both inside the country and regionally. Walid inspired me with his energy and unwavering com commitment. It was because of that steadfast commitment that he, he, he became the first human rights defender to try it under Saudi, Saudi Arabia's new anti-terror law in 2014. He was charged with harming the reputation of the kingdom because he highly highlighted the violations of the authorities. He was charged with irritating the public opinion against the country's public order, a public order built to repression 
and, sub uh, and sub subrogation. But Walid, Muhammad, and Abdullah, along with many others, peaceful activists who are now behind bars, like Aziz al Yusuf, Lujain al Hudlul, Iman al Nafjan, Amal al Harbi, uh, Shadan al Anizi, and more others, were not simply irritating against public orders. People already know that things were bad. What these activists had showed them was that things could be different. And that's exactly what the authority feared most. These activists gave people hope. In celebrating these three men today, we highlight their long and ongoing fight for, the society, for a society where all its members are respected, their dignity and rights protected, and their differences and diversity celebrated rather than uh, suppressed. And in celebrating them, we renew our commitment to fight for their release and the release for all peaceful activists and prisoners of conscience inside Saudi Arabia, regionally, and across the world. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your thank touching you. contributions and thank you for being with us. We now have time for one or two questions to Omar and Yahya. Anybody would like to take the plunge? Yes, there is a question here in the back. Thank you so much for, for sharing these words with us. I was wondering, um, what do you want, what do you think we're sitting now in, in Switzerland, Geneva, uh, the UN is just, offices are just next door. What do you think the international community, including the UN and the EU, could do uh, to promote change in Saudi Arabia? I believe this moment, especially this moment, it's the right moment to put pressure on the Saudi regime. Right now, there is no any internal pressure. Anyone who tried to uh, do any internal pressure, they are behind the bars right now. And all activists, all reformers behind the bars. So inside the country, also there is no civil society institutions. The only pressure that could happen, it must be from outside the country. External pressure right now, that will polish the PR that's happened, or, or that's the work for the PR from MBS, the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia. He did amazing PR around the world, and lots of people around the world, they believe he's a reformer. But right now, uh, I think it's the moment to tell the truth and to say the truth. And that just could happen from outside the country, by NGOs, by states, by Human Rights Commission, and etc. cetera. Any other questions? Yes, there's a gentleman in the front. <coughs> Thank you very much. Would one way to help this be for us to encourage and ensure that our governments don't sell weapons to Saudi Arabia? <laughs> this is a very important question. <laughs> because especially with the war in Yemen, the Saudi Arabia, when they start the war in Yemen, a lot of people around the world and states, they keep supporting Saudi Arabia regardless of the violations and the war crimes in Yemen. Uh, but Selling arms to Yemen, uh, to Saudi Arabia, while they are, uh, committed these violations in, in the country and outside the country in Yemen, for example. This is really shameful for any country who keeps selling these weapons. Thinking about the contracts and the arms deals and the money and the business, and never think, think about the human rights values. Yes, there is difficulty to challenge regime who have lots of money like Saudi Arabia. And yes, there is, uh, if there is uh, contracts will stop, there is losing for money. But money doesn't mean anything if there is no respect for the human rights. Thank 
perhaps a quick question to you, Omar. You're going back to study in the U.S. when you're finished with these uh, celebrations. So what are you up to afterwards? Well, um, I'm thinking about after I head back, after I'm done from here, I'm going to go back to my apartment and get or to the hotel and start working on my homework because I got a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> That's very good. That's what we say to our students here. Well, thank you very much. I invite the public to join me in applauding Omar al khatami and Yahya Asiri and the three laureates. Thank you very much. Thank you. So I, I see our musicians are back on their seats, so you have the floor. Thank you very much. You will have recognized another movement of the septet of Beethoven. So it is now my pleasure to invite <coughs> Diana Risolio, the coordinator of the Geneva Environment Network, to please come on stage and present our next laureate, Diana. J'ai le plaisir d'être parmi vous ce soir pour honorer Yakuba Sawadogo du Burkina Faso, dont on dit qu'il est l'homme qui arrête le désert. Il reçoit le prix cette année pour avoir transformé les terres arides en forêts et démontré comment les paysans peuvent régénérer leur sol par l'utilisation innovatrice des savoirs locaux, traditionnels et autochtones. 
Nous allons à présent voir une vidéo qui introduit euh, Yacouba. C'est un peu comme ça. Comme vous l'avez vu, Yacouba Sawadoga est connu pour son action au Burkina Faso, où il fait la fierté de la nation, comme l'a clamé son président. Il est connu dans la région du Sahel et bien au-delà. Pour reprendre les mots du rapporteur spécial des Nations Unies pour le Sahel, et, et les quelques images, ce que vous avez vu sur les images qu'on vient de voir, Yacouba Sawadogo est admiré pour sa constance et sa persévérance. C'est une personnalité qui mérite reconnaissance. Yacouba accorde beaucoup d'importance à transmettre son savoir. Je profite donc de l'occasion qui m'est donnée pour souligner que la technique culturelle Zai, utilisée par Yacouba, dont vous avez vu quelques images, fait l'objet de travaux de recherche dans de nombreuses universités et instituts dans le monde, y compris dans cette région, déjà lorsque j'étais étudiante. Cette technique est d'ailleurs mentionnée dans le projet d'une des équipes sélectionnées pour le Geneva Challenge, qui sera présenté dans cette même salle demain soir et dont le thème est les changements climatiques. La relève semble donc assurée pour soutenir Yacouba Sawadogo, que j'invite d'ailleurs à, à, à me rejoindre sur cette estrade sous vos applaudissements. Pas la la nébénition de la femme, c'est que 
near the Fanam Manago. Tinganga sent Pamanaga, your two needle. Then it bought him to your song door, to your little toy yakining. ตุ้มเดียวตุ้มเดียวใจอ่ะตุ้มเดียวใจอ่ะบาลใจส่งกระทิ้งกันเลยบิส่งกระลุ้มซะลิงส่งกระอัดมีซะเนี่ยเรา
the Bonhoeffer and Tia Managazi Kama, the Tuma King Taure. Nowadays, my land is still given away to other people. But what I want to add is to let people know that we don't have enough space to give um, my, my forest to other people. We need to take care of this. And what I want to say more is... Um, we should take uh, care of the earth and not let it just... Uh, get ruined. The earth is everyone's and we need to take care of it because if we don't take care of it, it will get even worse. Thank you very much, Yakuba. Thank you, thank you. So I would now like to call on stage one of our master's students, McFarlane Shungu, who will introduce the last laureates to you. McFarlane. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I'm here to introduce uh, Mr. Tony Rinaldo. He was awarded the Right Livelihood Award for demonstrating a large, for demonstrating that on a large scale, how dry land can be greened at minimal cost, improving the livelihoods of millions. Before I go any further to introduce him, I'd like you to see just a glimpse of what this man has been able to achieve in a short video. If you work with nature, miracles are, are possible. Even in a dry uh, region with intermittent or irregular rainfall, you can turn that around when you work with nature to make it a highly productive and stable system. Growing up as a smallholder farmer in Zambia, I've seen the consequences of climate change. Irregular rainfall, droughts, dying trees and dying crops, and as a result, food insecurity. Being so closely impacted, my friends and I got involved. We decided to educate ourselves about climate change, and we decided to, to educate the people around us. But we did not stop there. We also took part in um, local community initiatives such as tree planting. As a master's student at the Graduate Institute, majoring in environment and sustainability, I came to know of a man whose work has left me inspired beyond measure. He is credited for launching a tree regeneration technique that has led to the regeneration of forests um, for millions of hectares in Niger and various Closest, various places across the globe. The beauty of, of Mr. Tony Rinaldo's work is that it is premised on the idea that people are at the center of environmental problems, but it does not stop there. It goes a step further, realizing that if people are at the center of the problem, 
than they can be at the center of the solution. And this is so evident in how Mr. Tony Ronaldo's work is conducted. He understands that abating the consequences of climate change requires inclusion and collaboration. And most importantly, it's about changing people's attitudes and perspectives. What is also remarkable about Mr. Tony Ronaldo's work is that he has sought to empower ordinary farmers on how they can use their simple tools and their vast knowledge. Ordinary farmers that are often left out of mainstream policies. Mr. Tony Rinaldo, for me, is a constant reminder that sometimes the most complex problems require just simple solutions. He is a man that has reminded me that abating the consequences of climate change begins with me, it begins with you, it begins with all of us. It's not about who we are, it's about what you and I collectively and individually can do for this earth. It is such a great honor and a great privilege for me to stand here and introduce a man that has inspired so many of us through his work. A man whose mark on this earth will never be forgotten. My role model, Mr. Tony Renardo. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, good friends, my new Right Livelihood family, and my dear wife Liz, who loves me unconditionally, <laughs> who stood by me, encouraged me, corrected me, advised me, raised our children in my many absences. I'm so happy to be here and so honoured. Thank you. As a boy, anger and despair about it, environmental degradation on the one hand, and global hunger, on the other, drove me to pray that somehow, somewhere, God might use me to make a difference in the world. And my life since then has been an attempt to be true to that prayer. Farmer managed natural regeneration is a re-greening technique that involves growing indigenous trees, sometimes from living tree stumps, sometimes from roots, sometimes from just seeds in the ground, through selecting, pruning, and managing the growing stems. Rapid reforestation at low cost is possible, meeting farmers' needs while addressing pressing environmental issues. Conventional reforestation in West Africa costs as much as $8,000 per hectare. Over a 20-year period, farmer-managed natural regeneration spread to 5 million hectares in Niger, adding around 200 million trees to a previously barren landscape. And it cost in the order of $2 per hectare in terms of internal, external investment. Fellow Australian Right Livelihood Laureate, Bill Mollison wrote, while the problems of this world are increasingly complex, the solutions remain embarrassingly simple. The re-greening movement in Niger demonstrated that desertification could be reversed quickly at low cost and at scale. Today in Niger, the additional value of what is consumed plus what is sold going directly to farmers amongst the poorest in the world is in the order of US $900 million per year every year. Nigerian farmers are growing an additional 500,000 tonnes of grain annually because of the improved microclimate. These results were achieved in one of the poorest countries in the world on the edge of the Sahara Desert, without government support, without fertiliser or ir irrigation, and with minimal external inputs. And I, I want to salute my friend, uh, Yakuba Saradago. He achieved what he did without books, without experts, and without foreign money. So. <laughs> In other words, re-greening empowered some of the world's poorest, most marginalised people to lift themselves out of poverty and hunger. Having witnessed the horrors of famine firsthand and being witness to the changes wrought by ordinary people embracing re-greening, I'm compelled to a life of sharing this story, uh, uh, the story of this transformative technique. 
The solution to multiple problems is, in Bill's words, embarrassingly simple. This award acknowledges that poor people are only victims of poverty and beholden to the largesse of the rich to the degree that they are denied knowledge and access and legal user rights to the world's natural resources upon which we all depend. The award celebrates and is testimony to the intelligence, perseverance and dignity of these people. As much as farmer-managed natural regeneration is a regreening technique, it, it, it is also a means of restoring hope. And when you have hope, you can do anything. Imagine being a parent who can't feed, clothe and educate their children. Imagine the lack of self-esteem. Uh, and then, in a relatively short time, using your own intelligence and hard work and the resources at hand, by working in harmony with nature, you have more food, higher income, and much greater resilience to the inevitable climatic shocks that will come your way. Despite its significance and increasingly well-documented impact, this method is relatively unknown to national governments, international aid agencies, and donors. This award is an acknowledgement of the work of millions of small-scale farmers and hundreds of colleagues and associates my hope is that the award will create greater awareness of, support for, and adoption of this little known but highly effective land revegetation technique. I believe that this prize will enhance and speed up the activities which international organisations such as World Vision and the Global Evergreening Alliance are already heavily engaged in, including contributing to Africa's goal of restoring 100 million hectares of degraded land which sits under the overarching umbrella of the Bonn Global Challenge to restore 350 million hectares of degraded land by 2030, an area uh, the combined size of India. One degraded hectare is one too many, yet the World Resources Institute says there are at least two billion hectares of degraded land worldwide. One hungry person is one too many, and yet FAO tells us that currently 815 million people go to bed hungry every night. The UNCCC gives us just 10 years to rein in uh, greenhouse gas emissions or else fa face runaway climate change. For the last 20 years, I've been providing evidence which demands a verdict. When the poorest country in the world, on the edge of the Sahara Desert, with no government assistance and minimal NGO intervention, can affect an environmental, social and economic revolution that change the trajectory of their history, what does that say to us? As the great philosopher lay dying on the footpath, he looked straight into the, his crying nephew's eyes and said, with great power comes great responsibility. <laughs> Actually, it was Spider-Man's uncle but that doesn't lessen the truth of his wisdom. Who has power? Who has wealth? Who has agency, if not us? And who has responsibility to avert current and future catastrophe? I, I learnt a little while ago that my name, Tony, if you spell it backwards, reads, why not? <laughs> and I think... I think that's a rather good question to ask ourselves. Why couldn't we affect a regreening revolution that changes the destiny of current and future generations? Victor Hugo said, there is nothing more powerful than an idea whose time has come. And I believe that the time has come for unprecedented regreening movement. We have the evidence, the precedent in Niger. We have the power and the wealth. We have the agency and yes, we can't avoid it. We have the responsibility. Why not? Will you join me?
I'll join you. I'll join you. <laughs> you got one. So we have time, unfortunately, for one question. But I would like to add that both Jakuba and Tony are at the uh, Environment uh, House at 10.30 tomorrow, 9.30 tomorrow to present their work. And Tony will also come back a second time here at the Institute at 12.30. So there will be plenty of time for questions to these two gentlemen. But do we have one question? Yes, this gentleman. Thank you so much for your work and congratulations. Um, you know, there's, there's been a talk and a campaign for a green war, a great green war across the Sahel in Africa, from Djibouti all the way to Dakar, 8,000 kilometers of belt of trees. Now, would it, I would like to just hear your thoughts about utilizing the techniques that you've promoted and that uh, Uncle Sawadogo has done in this great effort, rather than the kind of approaches that our governments are undertaking. Mm -hmm. So the, the techniques for the Great Green Wall, I, I, I think these um, tradi traditional knowledge-based techniques speak for themselves. There's plenty of evidence showing uh, the impact, the efficacy of these techniques. But underlying them, no matter what technique you use, you have to have the full engagement, ownership and empowerment of the people. Even FMNR will not work if it's not owned by the people. It's deliberately called farmer managed, not Tony managed or World Vision or something else. And this is the secret. When you give it away, it's, it takes on a life of its own. So yes, definitely, these te techniques are appropriate. They will work. But it's the way you approach it and the, and the, the if of, of empowering people to run with it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tony. Thank, Thank you again. And see you tomorrow. So before closing this wonderful celebration, we couldn't resist by asking the 2012 laureate of the Right Livelihood Foundation, Sima Samar, to address the audience, give us a few words uh, about your award and your work. Sima. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, good evening to all of you. I think I was told to only speak for one and a half minutes, so I'm, <laughs> I'm not going to take a lot of your time. Uh, first of all, I would say that we are, this year we are celebrating 17th anniversary of Universal Declaration of Human Rights, which uh, is a strong uh, document between violent aggression in civilized uh, living. Uh, it does recognize the um, dignity of, uh, of people uh, everywhere, just being the fact that we are, we are here and we have the rights, doesn't matter where, where we live, which language we speak, which color we have, and everything. I think that is the core value of, of the Right Livelihood Award as well. The second point that I would like to mention that I would like to, uh, to welcome the new laureates to the family. And I have to say that they are exceptional personalities and human being who is really um, ready to, um, to take the risk and support the, the people and the human rights of the others. And I have the pleasure to be a member of the family and I hope that we will be able to, to do something positive uh, for the people that need us or we need them. The third part that I would like to mention is that I would like to call on people to please nominate strong women. <laughs> Not only women, but of course men and women, but more women because we need to have more women. And I am saying this because, uh, again, mentioning the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the equality. We don't have enough women within the family, although we have 25%, but it is not enough. Let's try to, to um, act 
not only believe on equality, but really act on equality and prove it that we believe on equality. And thank you very, very much for being tonight with us. And thank you for giving me the chance to speak for one and a half minute, I hope. But thank you very much. And it's a pleasure to be among these exceptional people. Thank you very much. Thank you. If I can ask our musicians, and you will notice that we have a number of women musicians to come on stage and uh, play for us the last move movement of the Septet of Beethoven. Thank you very much to Le Sepre d'Or de Genève. And I would like to mention specifically Matthew Chin at the violin. <laughs> Jeanne Diard, viola. Camille Kwan, cello. 
Victor Antoine, double bass. Bruna Moreira, clarinette. Marianne Tozin, horn. And Carla Ruo, bassoon. And also their professor, Antoine Marguier. I'm not sure he's here tonight. He is here. Bravo, Antoine. Thank you. So this celebration has come to an end, but I have a few words of thanks to give. First of all, the Swiss Agency for Development and Cooperation for your support, the Geneva Environment Network, Diana, the International Federation for Human Rights, the International Network of Human Rights, the Mirna Mack Foundation, and colleagues at the Right Livelihood Award Foundation and also at the Graduate Institute who work really hard to make this evening possible for you. So thank you for all for being here. Congratulations to our laureate. And I hopefully will see you next year at the same time. Thank you. Thank you.